My name is Samet. I work at Facebook as a research engineer. And uh, today I'll be talking about PyTorch. Thanks for coming. This is my first Strange Loop, and it's it's my first programming conference as well. Um, so it's it's a very new experience. I traditionally only go to machine learning conferences. So I tried to make this talk. Um, Usually, I give PyTorch talks to the machine learning audiences, so I try to make this talk a little bit more about general engineering and uh, the challenges we face by building it. So uh, this talk needs a little bit of context. Uh, before I talk about PyTorch itself, I need to talk a little bit about deep learning and neural networks. Um, and so I'll be doing that in the first few minutes of the talk. and. Then I'll be going towards PyTorch, just generally about the package, how it works. And the last section would be about uh, general perf, like what we did in terms of engineering in PyTorch to, to make sure that uh, our, the performance of PyTorch is uh, really fast and challenges state of the art. So starting with deep neural networks, um, the first first few slides are really to bait you to be interested in the talk. They're just pretty pictures. Uh, in, in, in recent times, uh, deep learning and specifically neural networks have become pretty popular. Uh, and typically, neural networks have been doing uh, tasks where you give it a particular input. Typically, it's an image or a text sentence uh, or a, a speech sequence. And then the network would uh, perform some task, like it'll give you some output. Uh, one, one task is um, um, semantic uh, segmentation, where if you're given an image, the neural network then has to segment each particular object of interest in the image. Um, and you can do crazier things. You can do captioning. Uh, for each part of the image, you want a neural network to describe what's going on um, in the image. Um, and this is something you probably you used uh, at some point in life, a machine translation, you know, translate from one, one, uh, one language to another. And these days, if you go to Silicon Valley, there's like hot dog apps that try to recognize whether there's a hot dog or not, or you know, there's all kinds of uh, other apps that are like, oh, point the camera to something and make it do something intelligent. And uh, in robotics as well, uh, neural networks are becoming uh, sort of a standard um, where you train your neural network to do a particular task in an end-to-end -end fashion, where you only give it uh, some uh, input-output data pairs of like how to do the task. For example, so a human showing the neural network how to do the task, and then the neural network automatically learning from, from these uh, videos on what the task is and how to do it. Um, there's more interesting stuff like synthesizing faces, um, generating faces, like a neural network, are, like, it, it looks at a bunch of face data sets and it understands how to generate new faces. Uh, similarly, a lot of synthesis problems. Uh, one of them is image transformation problems. So um, this is a neural network called an adversarial network that, that transforms the left image into the right image. Uh, and it's, in this case, it was trained to transform horses into zebras. But um, again, the neural network doesn't really know what a zebra is or a horse is. It's just given input output pairs, and it's just doing the transformation. And these are all learned end to end. And they're all powered by um, neural networks and trained using this one algorithm called backpropagation. So typically, in all of the neural networks that you've, you've seen so far, like all, you've seen the applications of a bunch of neural networks. And in all of these neural networks, you have operations of certain kinds. Almost all of these neural networks that I, I showcased uh, the underlying operations that they do are um, a few. One of them is convolution, where you're given an input signal, like a 1D, 2D, or 3D signal, and then you convolve that signal with 
some mask that you learn, and you get an output operator. Uh, and in neural networks, you have uh, you have multiple input channels, and then for each input channel, you would generate multiple output channels, and then you chain these things together, and that's what you sort of call a neural network. Um, and if you implement a convolution naively, it, uh, uh, one that's in the neural network context, it would be a six nested for loop. And this is probably not going to be particularly fast. And other operations are uh, something similar to convolution we call pooling, where you take the window and you look at it, but instead of doing a multiplication, you can do other kinds of operations, like for example, averaging or taking the max element in the window. Um, and then you do matrix multiplies. So you take your input and then you take some, some weights that you're learnable weights, and then you just do matrix multiply between them and you get your outputs. And you also do a lot of pointwise operations. Um, so typically, they look like this. You have some for loop looping over the, your entire input uh, matrix. Uh, and you do some operation on it. And then you write it to your output. And you also do reduction operations, like uh, taking the sum of all elements in your tensor. So it's a reduction because you're going from n elements to, say, k elements, where k is less than n. So these are the typical building blocks. Uh, there's like a few more of, in the long tail, but typically these are the most dominant building blocks. Most, most operators are of this nature in neural networks. And what you do is you chain them together. You, from the input, you put one operator um, that's learnable and then do another operator on it and more operators. And then you just chain them on and on. And uh, this, this field, this subfield is called deep learning because you essentially make these neural networks really deep. You chain them together um, quite deeply. And then if you, if you have some kind of cycle where your <clears throat> one of the outputs is going uh, to itself as an input, then that's called a recurrent neural network. And they're all trained with uh, this algorithm that we call gradient descent. So let's look at a tiny computation graph of a neural network uh, which has some inputs. And then your output is at the bottom. It's called next edge. So with neural network packages, with all uh, neural network packages, you can compute the gradient of one node with respect to another node. So next hatch is the output. And I want to now compute the derivative of next hatch with respect to the learnable weights w hatch at the top. And you can do that automatically with, with neural network packages. And then you do what you call a stochastic gradient descent step, where you update your weight so slightly to produce the output that you actually want to produce. So I update my weight with uh, the derivative. Uh, I, I subtract the derivative of uh, the output with respect to my weight. And um, intuitively, what this is typically doing is if I have a neural network that is trying to predict cats, then I give my input, which is a cat image, and then I get my output. And then you compute some loss function, which is my output actually said dog, uh, which is of distance x away from where cat is supposed to be. And you compute that distance, and you take the derivative with respect to that, that loss. And then if you update your weight with respect to this derivative, then your weight will go in a direction where it will try to maximize towards the cat, the probability of producing cat the next time. And so you do this over and over. You do this particular equation over and over with a lot of data and a lot of these update steps. You get, uh, you get to the output that you train your neural network to produce. So that's a neural network 101. And so all the neural network frameworks are what you call computation graph toolkits. You just have 
uh, you just define a graph of computation, which is in which is, it might be a neural network, and then you give inputs, and then you give the graph, and you say compute this graph with, with these input variables, and then you get an output. And there's two kinds of typical computation graph toolkits. One is declarative toolkits. Uh, some of the popular ones in, on the declarative side are Theano or TensorFlow. Um, and in these cases, uh, in declarative toolkits, what you do is you declare uh, what your model is supposed to look like, what your neural network is supposed to look like. Typically, a Python script de declares your model. And then you might compile it. And if you want to actually execute the model, you give it to the virtual machine that, that the toolkit has. So the virtual machine takes this model definition, compiles it into its own intermediate representation, and then it executes it inside its own virtual machine. As a tiny example, um, here's an example of a small program in TensorFlow. Um, <clears throat> so here, you, you first, uh, in lines 7 and 8, you declare what are your input and output uh, variable names. And these are called placeholder variables. And then you have a model definition that, that, that it's basically a, this declarative definition that you're going to reuse again, again and again. And finally, you will execute your, your model inside a, a, a TensorFlow session, which is the virtual machine session. And that, that model definition is taken to TensorFlow's VM implementation, which is written in C++ somewhere, and it's executed there. And the results outputs are given to, back to you. So those are declarative toolkits. And there's other kinds of toolkits, which are imperative toolkits. Um, PyTorch is, is one, one of those kinds. You don't have a separate VM. You use your host language's runtime as the machine that you're running your computations in. Um, as an example, here's a small PyTorch program um, where there's, there's no separation of model definition or declaration uh, for that matter. It's just, it's like writing interpreted code. Um, and then in line 16, you, you call this backward function that automatically computes the derivatives with respect to the elements you care about. So typically, um, if it's an imperative toolkit, debugging is slightly easier because you just write your definition and you use the debugger tools in, in the same language. So if you write this in Python, you can just use Python's debuggers. Um, and also, like the, the code flow is generally linear. There's no separation between where you declare your model and where you, where you run it. Because if you have a runtime error, then you don't have to map back to oh, I, I ran into this error, but the stack trace is not at where I declared my model. It's, it's at where I ran it. So it, it might be confusing in a declarative model to try to map these things back. But in, in an imperative model, you get a stack trace on wherever you, your error occurred. So it's much easier to debug. Uh, the downsides are that unlike in a declarative model where you t take your model, define it, and you compile it, and then you send it to a VM, you have the compilation step, and you can write additional passes. Uh, uh, you can build like a full-blown compiler uh, to make that particular model way more efficient. But in an imperative toolkit, you cannot really compile your program ahead of time, because you don't know what your particular program is ahead of time. Um, so you can do stuff like static analysis. However, you can take a just-in-time approach to this, just like JavaScript does. Um, I will get to that eventually. So coming to PyTorch itself. So PyTorch is, has, set, it, I mean, for, like first and foremost, it has an automatic differentiation engine so that you can run neural networks and train them and so on. But at the core of PyTorch, you have an NDRA library, uh, just like NumPy, uh, but it has strong GPU support. You can uh, compute, uh, do your computations on NVIDIA GPUs. Um, the NDRA library is pretty feature complete. It's very similar to NumPy. Um, as, as a quick example, uh, here's a, a program 
on the left side it's written with the NumPy API and on the right side it's written with the PyTorch API. I don't really expect you to read this program, it's just as an illustration on how similar the APIs are. Um, so to actually use PyTorch, you would import the package torch and then you can construct uh, uh, NDRA matrices. Here it's a, it's a matrix, 2D matrix, um, and you can print them and you can uh, get their sizes and it's, it's just standard stuff. And you can do indexing, like you can create a tensor and then you can slice only parts of the tensor that you want uh, and then do further operations on it. Um, you can do all kinds of math operations, linear algebra operations. Um, and if you want to convert a PyTorch tensor to NumPy array and vice versa, it's pretty seamless and also it is uh, very efficient because we, what we, typic we, what we do at the back end is if you convert a NumPy array to a PyTorch tensor, we keep the same memory pointer between both of them. So it's a zero memory copy operation and it's typically uh, almost free in practice. So if, you, if you're a NumPy user uh, or if you generally use the Python data science ecosystem, uh, it's very seamless to go back and forth. And uh, so like the consequence of keeping the data pointer to be the same between PyTorch and NumPy is that if you change the PyTorch tensor, the NumPy, NumPy array automatically changes and vice versa. So the, uh, one of the benefits of using PyTorch is you can use GPUs um, for all of your computation. And typically, if you're doing something like neural networks or if you're doing stuff like matrix factorization and stuff, GPUs are much faster. Um, and it's pretty transparent on how to use GPUs. If you have a particular tensor that you created, you can just call x dot, like here is x is a tensor that you just created. You just call the CUDA function on it. And then x will just be transferred onto the GPU. And any operations you do further on x will be done on the GPU itself. Um, then coming to the automatic differentiation engine that we have, uh, it's used for neural networks, deep learning, reinforcement learning. Uh, we have uh, the uh, we have uh, the AutoGrad package as part of PyTorch, and we have one class that we define that's called variable. And variable is this loose wrapper around a tensor, and whatever operations you do on your variable, all of its history is recorded. Um, so as an example, I, I defined a few variables uh, here. And then I do operations like matrix multiplies and uh, additions on them. And what actually is happening is next hedge, the variable here, has a pointer to the function that computed it. And that function has a pointer to the inputs that uh, it had, and so on, until you get to your leaf variables that the user defined. And so this is how uh, you can do automatic differentiation because you have pointers to everything that computed uh, uh, that was that that was uh, your parent that that you uh, that you are the output of. So on the f like uh, on the final variable, you can call the backward method, which will compute the gradients of one node with respect to another, and. That's pretty much how almost all of PyTorch's neural networks work. Um, basically, the neural networks are Python programs. There is like almost no difference between what you call a neural network or a Python program in PyTorch. We built a small convenience wrapper around the Autograd engine called the NN package. And all it does is it, it defines all the typical operations that you see in neural networks, like convolution and pooling and so on. It just builds object-oriented wrappers around it. And so as, an, as a quick example, this is a small neural network that is defined that's called a convolutional neural network. Um, it, in the constructor of this neural network, you just define some of the layers that you would want to learn um, that, that, that have learnable weights. 
And in the forward function, this is where you define your neural network. You're basically, um, your x here is the input to the neural network. And you're writing a small Python program that defines how the input maps to your output that is returned. And that is uh, the neural network that you're gonna, that you can use and to train, like, uh, you, you can, for example, uh, write Python for loops based on some conditional of the input and so on, and that's, that's how you define your neural network itself. And uh, I did mention that you, you typically do this small stochastic gradient descent update rule to update your weights so that they get better and better towards the task that you're trying to train the neural network for. And for that, we have an optimization package. And the way this package works is uh, typically you would have some data set of input-output pairs. Your inputs are taken by the neural network and you want some output to be produced. And this could be anything from image recognition to uh, ad targeting. And so you just loop over your data set and you create some optimizer beforehand, uh, let's say a, a stochastic gradient descent optimizer. You pass the input to your neural network, which is a model, and then you get some output. And then you compute some, some loss function that tells the neural net, that tells the training procedure how far away your output is from the variable that you actually want to produce, which is a target variable. And then you, you compute the gradients, and then you do the uh, update rule. Uh, and then you do the update rule. So that's PyTorch in a nutshell. And now I'll be talking about what we had to do to make PyTorch uh, as fast as any of the other neural network packages. The way we wrote PyTorch was one of the worst cases for like an engineer's perspective because it's like this very dynamic Python-y program. And so we constantly had to fight Python uh, because Python is slow. And especially for like, if you're trying to fight nanoseconds, Python is, is really slow. Like, if, if you write some very simple argument parsing, like, oh, if my, I have some keyword arguments, if this keyword is true, go to this code path, or else go to this other code path, something as simple as this can take microseconds. And that's very frustrating because you use really fast GPUs, and the entire operation on the GPU probably will take a microsecond as well. Um, the second thing is Python has this thing called global interpreter lock. It's evil. It's really horrible, especially when you're trying to do um, stuff that's high performance. You are queuing. Uh, so typically, what we see is um, in neural network workloads, we want to use X GPUs. We want to use eight GPUs at a time. And if you're trying to queue uh, our, if, you, if you're trying to queue our, uh, our operations through Python on all the GPUs, just the queuing becomes a bottleneck. That is, the, like, if you have eight GPUs and eight threads queuing the operations on each, for each of the GPU, eight Python threads, then because of the gill, we can't really see full parallelism because even if you have eight Python threads, each of them is um, waiting on another thread because of this global lock that exists. So we, we fight it in various ways. One of the simplest ways is we just move all of our functions to C, C, C or C++ that are actually important. Um, it's a subtle trade-off because um, as users of Python, uh, as users of PyTorch itself, you want to make sure it's very easy to debug and extend while you're working with it day to day. But if you want performance, then the biggest hotspots cannot be in Python. So the reason we went down Python, like instead of using C++ directly, why we went to use Python is because Python is the most popular data science language. Uh, and it's very convenient for all of our users to use Python. But we have to make these constant trade-offs and fight Python all the time. Um, and 
The other set of things I want to talk to you about uh, in terms of performance is why, why do we use GPUs so much? Uh, it might or might not be obvious uh, to you guys. So neural networks are embarrassingly parallel. And GPUs typically have 3,000, like high-end GPUs have 3,000 cores that can run computations in parallel. So as I want to recap, the typical operators you have in neural networks, one of them is convolution. If you think about it, look at this operation. Um, you're looking at a window and taking some uh, multiplications and summing them into an output channel. And the, the animation here is doing each of them in a serial fashion, like one after the other, like a sliding window of sorts. But there's no reason you could, you could just do each of these instances completely in parallel. And uh, typically, all of the operators that I described are uh, like that. So, so in terms, uh, and pooling is something similar. You know, you do this, uh, you do the sliding window across height and width. Uh, matrix multiply is something similar. Uh, for example, to compute the yellow and the green uh, uh, outputs, you don't really need, you don't have any data dependence between them. You can compute them completely independently. Um, and if you look at pointwise operations. Each of these operations is not dependent on another i. So each i is independent and can be fully parallelized. So uh, I, let me take a quick uh, example to explain. So let's look at the simple use case. Let's say a, b, c, and d are tensors, and I want to compute a plus b times c. So this is kind of how the code would look. Um, I first compute a plus b, I get some output, and then I take the output and compute c. This operation is completely memory bandwidth bound um, because typically the tensors in our workloads exceed the size of the L1 or L2 caches of your CPUs or, or you know, the like the register caches of your GPUs. They, they run as fast as how fast you can get these things into registers from main memory and back out again. And as I said, L1, L2 caches are useless. Um, all of them, all of the functions that I described so far, except for convolution and uh, in some cases matrix multiply, they are all memory bound. So if you have faster memory, these operations will run faster. So high end GPUs have very fast memory, much faster than system main memory. Um, the, the latest GPUs that you can buy, they have this memory called HPM2 memory, which has about a tera, uh, something around a tera, uh, terabyte a second in and out of the, in, in and out of uh, the GPU main memory, which is much, much faster than, than CPU main memory that you see. So generally, using GPUs, regardless of the parallelism, is beneficial if your operations are bandwidth bound. I think we've, um, I've seen in recent times people implementing uh, databases on top of GPUs. And I think the main reason is because it's just higher memory bandwidth. And, and GPUs have the highest memory bandwidth that you can buy conveniently. And GPUs like parallelizing. Uh, parallelizable problems. Uh, all the operations I showed you and I described to you are embarrassingly parallel. Let's look at this particular uh, six for loop, for example. It's, it's the uh, naive implementation of a convolution. Every single for loop here can be exploited for parallelism, and, and you basically have unbounded parallelism right here. Um, and one of the optimizations we, we really need to do in terms of uh, such workloads is try to make them more compute bound. If you see this, 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 these two for loops here, I'm first taking A plus B and then putting it back into main memory as out one. And then again, I'm loading out one into main, from main memory into, into registers and multiplying it with uh, C. And it really doesn't have to be like that. Um, you can do stuff like operator fusion. You can take these two separate operators and then you can just fuse them at runtime. And 
that's one of the biggest benefits of compilation. You can generally do fusion and make your memory bandwidth operators into compute bound operators. Um, um, this is one of our typical use cases in neural networks where we have these chains of convolution operations which uh, some kind of normalization operation and a simple pointwise operation. And doing some operator fusion here really gets us big benefits, like 30%, 40% faster uh, overall over large networks. And if you have a compiler, you can reorder things. You can send off um, one uh, particular operation to a particular coprocessor that you have. Let's say you have all of your matrix multipliers can be sent to the GPU, but all of your sparse tensor operations can be like sent to the CPU because sparse operations are nicer on the CPU in general. Um, so it's, ob it's been obvious to us that we need a compiler, especially as GPUs themselves are getting faster and CPUs and main memory is not keep keeping up. So we built a compiler for PyTorch. Um, it's because PyTorch is a fully dynamic program, we don't know what the, what the neural network is ahead of time. Um, we had to build a just-in-time compiler and we built uh, a tracing uh, JIT. And the way tracing JITs work, this is a very simple, small example. Don't kill me if you're a compiler expert. Uh, but uh, let's take this function foo, which uh, adds 1 to x, uh, its input, and then multiplies 2 uh, to the result and returns uh, z. So you can give uh, some input x, and it will produce y uh, of of the corresponding result. And in a tracing JIT, what we built was you just annotate your function that you want to trace with, with some function decorator. And the first time you run, uh, run this function, it will take the input tensor, and then it will run each of these operations, and it will record all of the operations that happened on tensors themselves. So it will run this line, and then the, the trace recorder records that, oh, there was an add operation that happened, and there was a result t1, and then there was a mul multiplication operation that happened on the t1, and that was returned. And when you run y2 equals foo of x, like when you run the same function again, it actually shortcuts um, the entire Python code path, the entire uh, code that you wrote, and instead it uses its trace, it gives the trace to our, our uh, C++ interpreter, and uh, it just executes the trace itself and not the original uh, Python function. And we cache traces, so typically if you run the same function again and again, we will cache it and use the trace rather than this original function. There's two benefits to it. One, we avoid Python, we avoid Gil, we avoid all that sl slowness. The second benefit is that we can now write optimization passes uh, to do stuff like operator fusion. Like once you get a trace, we can pa pass the trace through several optimization passes and we would get a faster code. And uh, a little more details about our, our JIT. Uh, it's an it has an intermediate representation where tensors are uh, first class types. And uh, it is optimized for reusable and cache traces. That is, we expect our traces to be run again and again and again. Unlike, for example, if you write a JavaScript tracer, you write your tracer for very branchy code, uh, and you don't really expect a lot of your, like, your traces to be uh, executed millions of times, maybe like hundreds of times or so. Um, but I'm also not an expert in JavaScript tracers. so um, and. One of the gotchas that we have in our tracer that we are trying to solve in various ways is you, we cannot handle control flow yet. Uh, as a small example, um, this is a function that looks at the total uh, sum of the, the, ten, the input tensor. And if the sum is less than 5, it will go to uh, the first uh, code return. And if otherwise, it will uh, go to the second return. And something like this. When we execute uh, this function for the first time with our tracer, it will go through one of the conditionals. And subsequently, if we give it a, 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 a tensor that will trigger the other conditional, it'll just give the wrong result. 
And we're trying to solve this in various ways. One of them is trying to parse the Python AST itself and uh, build a trace by just from the AST. Uh, um, we have other ideas as well, but that's kind of the state of things. And uh, thank you for listening. This is my last slide. If you want to try PyTorch or if you like neural networks, go to pytorch.org. Give it a try. Uh, and uh, thanks to everyone who's been part of the community. And that's about it.